Hello chemistry students. I'd like to do a quick little problem today where we can at least touch on the ideas of something that they call relativistic contraction of atomic orbitals. I'm not going to go into great detail in what's going on, but I at least want to make sure you understand that this is an option and whatnot. So I'm going to get to that problem, but before I do, I thought it would be useful just to give a brief tutorial of these relativistic effects that we've learned from Einstein's theory of special relativity. So to begin with, we have this term here, gamma, so that's the Greek letter. And gamma is always this particular collection of terms that involves v, the velocity of an object, and c down there is the speed of light. Even though we think of special relativity as potentially being something extremely complicated, some of it can actually be explained using this algebraic term gamma. I want you to just look at it for a moment and I want you to notice something. You know there's a restriction on v. v must always be less than c, less than the speed of light. So we're talking about the actual velocity of something. So we can take a peek at this and we have this idea that v has to be smaller than c and so v squared over c squared has to be a quantity that's less than 1. And then if I take 1 minus that quantity, I'm still going to end up with yet another quantity that is less than 1. And then if I take the square root of a number that's less than 1, I'm going to get again another number that's less than 1. And then if I have 1 over this whole big pile of stuff here, but I know that it's still less than 1, 1 over a number that's less than 1 is going to return something to me that is greater than 1. So what I want you to recognize here is that the gamma term itself has all of the action happening in the denominator, but also the gamma term is always going to be greater than 1. So let me go over here and I'm just going to write this little reminder over here that gamma is greater than 1. As the velocity gets closer and closer to the speed of light, you will notice that this quantity in here underneath the radical, that will get closer and closer to the value of 1, then you will be almost 1 minus a full 1. That gets very small, which in turn blows gamma up. As you get going very, very fast, gamma gets larger and larger and larger. So now let's look at three interesting things that happen when you start to approach the speed of light. First, you have this thing called length contraction. And so the little subscript zero that you're seeing over here, that's essentially what somebody would observe if they were stationary and you're seeing the stationary frame of reference. And so if I have something that's traveling in this direction here, and there's some sort of stationary observer off to the side, so this is my little eyeball. The actual distance of this thing could be, for example, one meter or so. But as V increases and you start going very, very fast, there's actually a contraction in the direction of motion. And so it will get narrower. The stationary observer will no longer see this thing as being one meter in width. It'll be something less than that. It'll be much less than that if you're getting really, really close to the speed of light. Our equation shows that because remember, gamma is a value that's greater than one. So this L naught up here, that's where I would have had one meter. And then if gamma was, for example, two, then my stationary observer would have seen a length of 0.5 meters. Also very interesting, there's this thing called time dilation. So if I put some sort of fancy clock on an object that's moving, we've actually experimentally tested this, that clock is going to run, but according to the stationary observer, it appears to run slow. And so there's this other thing, this time dilation that happens. Again, if gamma was the value of 2, then if you were sitting on this fast-moving object, perhaps you know a rocket ship or something like that, you might see one minute go by, but the stationary observer would see that two minutes went by with time dilation. A third interesting thing that happens is your mass starts to go up. So length gets smaller, time starts to travel slower and mass goes up. So this is called the rest mass over here, this value. Now that's going to be relevant for the problem that I want to talk about. So you see here again this term gamma. It's neat that all of these three things can be described by this one gamma term here. But the mass of an object is going to go up. 
as it starts to get going really fast. Where that matters to me is that I want to talk about electrons and how fast moving electrons can actually have higher masses. So that brings up this problem here. I'm saying assuming an electron in the 1s orbital of a uranium atom is traveling at a relativistic speed and that its de Broglie wavelength is 2.6 AE minus 12 meters, so that's picometers, calculate its velocity. First, I will come over here and remind you that this is the de Broglie wavelength that is lambda sitting there, so that is the wavelength of our matter wave. This is Planck's constant, which is a constant value that I'm showing right there. And then P is the momentum. And what's interesting about P, so normally it's just mass times velocity. But when you are starting to get fast enough that you have to deal with relativity, you need to take into the account here that the mass is actually going to be the rest mass times that gamma quantity that I showed you before. Now remember, gamma had all the action happening in the denominator. And down here, I can show you that momentum itself is in the denominator of the de Broglie wavelength equation. So I have the radical and all those parts in the denominator of a denominator, which is why I've swung it up here, and it's now sitting in the numerator. So if you like, this is the equation that we're really interested in. And then I've given us the rest mass of the electron, the speed of light, and again, there's Planck's constant. Now, for anyone keeping score, you'll recognize that the problem set problem that I gave you actually gives you a velocity, a very fast velocity. You have a velocity that shows up here and one that shows up down here. And so if you start with that information, a known velocity, you can move pretty quickly on a problem like this. On my sample problem, we're going to solve for velocity. Unfortunately, that means there's going to be several algebraic steps we need to go through to make sure we get the right thing but I'm going to go ahead and show that for you. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this rest mass and I'm going to move it into the numerator on that side and I'm going to take Planck's constant and move it into the denominator over here. And so I'm going to have something that now looks like this. Lambda over Planck's constant times the rest mass of the electron is going to be equal to radical 1 minus v squared over c squared. This is all over v. I'll plug in all of these numbers later. v is really the thing I'm trying to solve for, so I'm going to isolate for v, and this is where the algebra comes in. I'm going to go ahead and square both sides now. So now I have lambda m naught over h quantity squared is going to be equal to 1 minus v squared over c squared over v squared. So remember I pick up a, a square down there in the denominator. I'm going to go ahead and grab a common denominator of this section of the numerator that's up here. So that's going to look like this. I'm going to have c squared over c squared. So c squared is my common denominator minus v squared over v squared. And then let's do one more step. Let's combine these denominators. And so it's now going to look like this, c squared minus v squared over v squared c squared. This is all still equal to this quantity over here. Now, in order to save myself a little, little work, or at least a little bit of writing, I'm going to define this as a new thing that I'm just going to call the constant k. And maybe I'll come over here just so we don't lose track of it, and I'll write that k is equal to lambda m naught over h quantity squared. So if you follow what I'm doing, I now have k on the left side of the equation, and I'm going to multiply this entire denominator over onto it. So it's going to be k times v squared c squared is equal to c squared minus v squared. So I'm making progress. Let me clear some board space up above here. Okay, so I'm actually moving up here for my next step. And I'm going to put this v squared that's over here. I'm going to put that on the other side. So now I have k v squared c squared plus v squared is equal to c squared. I'm going to factor out my v squared over there. v squared 
Now I have kc squared plus 1 is equal to c squared. And here I'm getting really close to my final expression. It's going to be v squared is equal to c squared over kc squared plus 1. And I'll write my last thing here, v. So I'm just square rooting both sides now. It's going to be equal to the square root of c squared over kc squared plus 1. That's all in the denominator. So I could factor out that c squared up there if I wanted to, but we've done enough. Let's go ahead and just work with what we have here. Okay, let's find the numeric value of k. So k is going to be equal to, I was given the de Broglie wavelength here, so I'm going to go ahead and write that in, 2.68 e minus 12. I don't have any unit problems right now, by the way, unit conversions. I tried to make sure that we at least didn't have to mess with that. Now we need the rest mass of the electron, which is 9.11 e minus 31. It's a minus in there. That's in kilograms. Divided by Planck's constant, 6.626 e minus 34. Okay, and then all of that squared. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and round this a little bit, but K is going to be equal to 1.3577. So I'll hold a fair number of digits there. E minus 17. And now I can plug that into that value right there. All right, I'm going to write this out, but not make you watch me do it. So V is going to be equal to... Okay, so there's the expression written out. And then you plug this in, and I find that V is equal to 2.01 E8 meters per second, which, if I take that as a fraction of C, 0 0.67 or 67% C. Okay, that's my final answer. So this variety of problem was a little bit algebra intensive, but what we've discovered is the velocity of the electron, or at least how we would model it, in this big heavy atom here, this uranium nucleus. So this, by the way, has to do with uh, being able to form a wave. So you have your little atom here and being able to form the wave as it's traveling around. So you can model it. And what you find, the end result, is that because the mass is going up, up here, because of relativistic effects, then the momentum goes up. And if the momentum goes up, then your lambda goes down. And to find a nice standing wave as your electrons moving around that big heavy nucleus, you need to have smaller lambdas. So you have a contraction of the orbitals. And so, whereas the 1s, which is what this problem was based on, might be expected to be of a particular size initially. By the time everything is said and done, it's actually smaller. It's contracted compared to what you would have expected. So anyways, hopefully uh, some of this made sense to you. And again, uh, this just happened to be a little algebra intensive. But uh, if it did make sense, you should let your computer know.